we had mentioned the name of the Midrash. How do we know the human being is the center of the universe and the objective of creation? So Rabbeinu Bachir writes, who was the last one to be created? The last creation to be created was the human being, Adam and Eve. Meaning, God only brought Adam on the scene after everything was in place, which means the world is fully functional. Now this is the challenge. This is the playing field. And therefore, God waited till the end because now we're ready for what we call real time. So the human being is the center of the universe. Everything around him is the surfing. I would once mentioned some a beautiful word from the Malbim. Malbim is a commentary on the Torah, on Torah, the prophets, and scripture. There's a procedure called chalitza. What is the prescription called chalitza? The Torah tells us that if you have brothers related through the same father, paternally they're related, and one of the brothers dies childless, has no children, there's a positive commandment, which is called leveret marriage, that one of the surviving brothers should marry the widow of the one who died childless to perpetuate the name of the deceased. That's what it's all about. That is the basis for the mitzvah. And every one of the surviving brothers who are related through the plural side are qualified to fill this mitzvah. What happens if they all choose to say we're not interested? They're not interested in performing this commandment. The woman, since she's bound, as a woman who's married, you have to terminate the connection between the husband and the wife, which it's terminated through the Jewish divorce, which we call get. That's the rid of divorce. But now she's free to marry whoever she chooses to marry of course, who's permitted to her. Identically, when the brother dies, there is a connection between the widow and all the surviving brothers. And that's why when they perform leverage marriage, only one of them, they take the place of the deceased and they perpetuate his memory. So it's called this bond. If none of them are interested in taking over this position, they have to terminate that connection. How is it terminated? Through a procedure called chalitza. What's chalitza? The widow comes before the bezdin, before the rabbinic court, and the surviving brother who's going to be involved in this procedure has a shoe, a leather shoe, on his right foot. And the surviving brother says, first the widow says, my surviving brother, he refuses to perform that leverage marriage. He's not interested. And he confirms it. He's not interested. So the Torah says she takes the leather shoe off his right foot. And he, she spits in his presence. Not on in his presence. And says, my brother-in-law refuses to perpetuate the name of his deceased brother. He doesn't want to perform this, this procedure, which, which is called leveret marriage. And then the Bezdin, the people who are present there, they say, this house has been undergone the procedure of Chalitza, and it's terminated, and this mitzvah cannot be fulfilled again. If a brother, after this procedure is given, has a change of mind, can't go back there. He's not permitted. Now, to marry the widow of the deceased once this procedure takes place because the bond has been severed. Normally, if a person marries the wife of a brother after she's divorced, after the brother's deceased, let's say they'd be children. It would be children. If the brother engages with that woman, whether she's a widow or divorcee, it's considered incestuous relationship. Torah says it's not permitted. And if the person does, and there's a child conceived, 
the child's considered a mamzer, illegitimate. The Torah says, however, in a situation where the man should die childless, not only is it not a necessary relationship, one is obligated. It's a mitzvah to marry the woman, take her on as a wife, to perpetuate the name of the deceased, and the child's a kosher child. The child's a legitimate child. Under normal circumstances, it's incest, and as a result of that, it's considered, it's illegitimacy, what we call a mamzer. But oh, in this context, where it's to perpetuate the name of the deceased, then it's a mitzvah, and the child is a valid, is a legitimate child. So the Malbim goes to explain why the leather shoe, if it's made of any other material, it's not valid. It has to be made of leather, which is an animal hide. The question is why? Now, evidently, this mitzvah has such great importance, monumental importance, that God says, although under normal circumstance, this is incest. Under normal circumstances, the issue of this relationship is mamzer. But for the, the mitzvah is so great, I permitted this relationship. Not only do I permit it, it's obligatory. And not only that, the child is a 100% kosher child. That's how great the value of perpetuating the perpetuating name of the deceased. So they asked the man, why don't you want to fulfill this very valuable mitzvah? So what does he say to the Bezdin? What does he say to the rabbinic court? She's not my cup of tea. Our personalities don't match. You know, she was red, I wear green. And there's no happy medium. We can't meet on blue. I'm saying this facetiously. So the court says, if you can't get them together, you terminate it. But what in essence is happening? Here the Torah, God turned the world upside down to permit this relationship, which is normally ancestral. To say the child is normally a mamzer, the child's not a mamzer, which indicates the great importance. And you're telling me, she's not your cup of tea. It's almost absurd. God said it's of the ultimate importance and it's demonstrated through the obligation and through the status of the marriage. And you're saying it's not your cup of tea. Now, the Gemara tells us, Rabbi Yochanan says that if a man has very little money and the only thing he could afford is a pair of leather shoes, you should buy leather shoes. Very important to buy leather shoes. What, what, what's, what does leather represent? Leather represents the animal. The mundane, the physical animal, that's leather. When a person takes the hide of an animal and he uses it for a shoe or for a mat and you stamp on it, you trample it, what does that say? How do you do such a thing? Are you, do you have greater value than the animal? You know what the answer is? The animal is only created to serve man, whether it's a beast of burden, whether it's for food, or whether it's for, it's for hide. To demonstrate that, we, we wear leather shoes. Leather. Leather is a statement, a declaration. The world was created for the human being. The human being is the center of the universe. We step, we wear the shoes on our feet. We step on the hide. We step on the animal. And when God created the world, it was created for that. It should accommodate all the amenities of the human being, every aspect of the animal. So what is God saying? Here I turned the world upside down to be able to address your spirituality, to perpetuate the name of the deceased, something which is normally incestuous is permitted. Not only, it's obligated. Something's normally legitimate, it's not illegitimate. And you're telling me it's not your cup. She's not your cup of tea. Our personalities don't match. You know something? You know better than the animal. You don't deserve to step up to wear those leather shoes. The woman takes the shoe off her foot, off his foot. You're not worthy. You know better than the animal. That's, that is the procedure. What it represents 
that's the, the statement which God says, that's the statement the woman does and through her action, removing the shoe, the leather shoe, you know what you are, you know better than the animal. If that's the case, you have no right to step on the animal. And this is where Yochanan says that if a person has very little money, but he can afford a pair of shoes, he should buy a pair of leather shoes. Because wearing leather on your feet is a declaration the world is at my beck and call. It's for me to utilize. Regardless of what it is, whether it's the animal, whether it's the fish, whether it's the bird, whether it's the material of existence, it's all here for me. The world was created for the human being. This is the location of choice. That's the Malbim. The human being cr being created last in creation. All the amenities are set in place. The vegetation, the water, the dry, the land, vegetables, fruits, fish, the sea, everything, forestry, whatever you need, it's in place. Now God introduces man, the human being, to, 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 to existence. Now you're ready for real time. Now you're ready to meet challenges and life's challenges. That's what it's all about. And the only species that has the ability we mentioned of choice is only the human being. Every other species, its function is purely based on its DNA. Its form, its color, its ability, its behavior is DNA. It's the way God created it. It's all instinctive behavior. A human being is not the case. Human being has instincts, but we have the power of choice. Within our intellect, we have a capacity to appreciate things and understand if it's right or wrong. And based on those understandings, we make decisions. Certain lines we don't cross, certain lines we do cross. We rationalize. And that's called failing. We justified things which are not justified because of conflicts of interest. Well, those areas of conflict of interest, that is the challenge. Do I allow myself to be drawn into that location and see through a colored lens? Or do I somehow transcend that situation and be more objective and make the right decision? That's what, that's what, that's what it's all about. That's choice. Only the human being has that choice. No other creature has that choice. Why? What is that choice? What is that ability? That ability is based on man was created in the image of God. But God has no image. So what does it mean? Let us create man in our image, our form. God has no image, he has no form. So what does it mean in our image, our form? God is infinite. There's no beginning, there's no end. So the commentators explain just as God does what he chooses to do, except the concept of choice has no relevance to God, well, see, God sees everything and knows it on an absolute level, but the human being has the ability to choose much of his life, every moment of our life. We're always within the context of making choices. That's how we reflect God's characteristic. That's his image. And as a result of that, we're given that commonality to God that if we make the right choices we have relevance to have a relation with God now that this, this is basic background on all we're discussing now it's cited in, based on psukim, or verses in prophets and scripture, that tzaddikim are God's partner, partners in creation. What does it mean we're partners in creation? Why was the Jewish people created? Of course, we were given a choice at Sinai. Do you want to accept my Torah? Don't you want to accept my Torah? All the nations of the world, they made a choice. They turned their back on God. The Jewish people also made their choice. We said we want it. Regardless of the extent of obligation, we accept it unequivocally. We made a choice. Due to that choice, 
we rose to a level that we have now the value and the purpose of existence. We assume the status of Adam. The world was created for you. The objective is to have a relation with God if you succeed through your choices. So if that's the case, what is the objective of creation? To bring about perfection. Now, who determines what perfection is? What's perfection? Well, God is the one who tells you what perfection is. If you live within the context of the commandments, the positive and negative commandments, and you succeed to a certain degree, you've achieved perfection. You've perfected yourself. The world has been perfected as a result of what you've generated, what you've contributed. It's perfection. If we fail, there is no world. There's no purpose. There's no value. So the value is existence is we should succeed. So if we succeed, why does God maintain and will eternity? Because we chose to follow his, his prescription of life. So, but who follows his prescription of life? The tzaddikim, the devoutly righteous. So if that's the case, they're his partners. They're his partners in creation. Because he wills existence, and due to their choices, they allow God to continue to will existence and to advance existence due to the participation of the tzaddik who appreciates and understands what his will is. But if he would turn his back on God, there's no existence. So at the end of the day, that there is an existence on the physical level, on a spiritual level, on eternity, it's due to, it's due to the choice of the tzaddikim. As a result of that, the tzaddik God says, they are my partners in creation. The angel is not the partner in creation. Because the angel is the equivalent of a spiritual robot. The angel is what God created him to be. The nations of the world, they've turned their back on God. They said, we're not interested. So the word nations are not giving existence value. They're not addressing the objective of existence. The Jewish people are. And it's, it's, it's a relationship. It's very interesting. When God created Adam, he says, I will create a helpmate, a woman who will be his helpmate, his assistant, his partner. What's the partnership? The, the primary person in a marriage is the man. He's the primary. He assumes all responsibilities. He's supposed to be the breadwinner. He's the one who actually takes the initiative to protect the family. He goes to battle. The man, the male goes to battle, not the woman. The woman takes care of the family. She attends to responsibilities that if he, she wouldn't, it's upon him and he can't address what he has to address as being responsible for the family, responsible for the world. She's so-called holding down the fort. He's defending the fort. We say Talmud Torah connected Kulam. The ultimate myth is Torah. A woman's not obligated in Torah. The man is obligated to Torah. He's the primary. The woman is an adjunct to him. She's part of his soul. But the function, the main function of that soul is, is the male, not the female. Now, in the relationship of God to existence, who's the main role player? God. God wills everything. Who are we? We are the recipients. He provides us with means. He wills our existence. He gives us all, whatever's needed to be in a position to make a choice. You know, a person is penniless and he has nobody to do charity with. Could he do charity? He can't do charity. So God provides, and now we have a choice. What do we do with that, that material? Do we go to Atlantic City? Do you go to that submarine to, to see the Titanic? Where do you go with it? Do you go to Davy Jones' locker? 20 legions below the sea? Where do you go with it? Or do you take it and you create a tower which ascends into heaven and beyond? What do you do with it? That's our choice. 
Do you want to dig a grave that there's no grave as deep as that grave? You can do that too. But do you want to build a structure which is eternal? That's man's choice. But who provides the means for either? God provides that means. So God is the so-called the male figure. The Jew, we are the recipients. He provides the means for us to, to make and utilize it to maintain the home. We are on the receiving end. God is the giving end. God wills. After he wills, now we utilize what he wills to be able to bring about what it's meant to be used for. Not to misappropriate it. To invest it as he wants it to be invested. Could you imagine? A husband gives his wife money to buy food and buy clothing for the family. And she goes and all day she plays Marja and she loses the money. Husband says, that's not what I give you the money for. Or buy yourself clothing and the kids don't have, you don't clothe the children, you don't feed the children. That's not what it's about. I gave you the money to take care of the family. God provides us with the means, whether it's intellect, whether it's health, whether it's material, to invest it in what it's meant to be invested in. What is that? It's called perfection. But if you do, then you're God's partner. Literally, the partnership. The Jew is the equivalent of the woman. God, his function, he's the male. Because he's the provider. We, the recipients of what he provides, not a question, what do we do with it? But I'm telling you that, that's the Ramchal. Therefore, the Jewish people are similar to the moon. The moon doesn't generate its own light. The, Jew, the moon reflects the light of the sun. It provides illumination. That's what it does. But where does, where does that illumination come from? It's a reflection of the sun. The sun generates its own light. The moon reflects that light. God generates everything. If we utilize it properly, we shine very brightly. It depends on what our choices are. That's why the, Jew, the existence of Jews throughout history, it's like the moon. Sometimes it's full, full moon, but sometimes it's a sliver. Due to our choices, we've regressed to a point. We've had serious setbacks because you're not in line with the source of illumination. When you're in line with the source of illumination, you reflect the full illumination of the sun through the moon. But if you're not aligned, what do you get? You have the sliver of light. You have a handful of tzaddikim, but if the Jewish people, they're not magnifying that light. They're not reflecting that light. That's the, that's the understanding. He cites in Zohar, which is the source of all Kabbalah, the Jewish people, or the earthly level, is called nukva. In Hebrew, the word nekeva means female. The Jewish people are the equivalent of nukva. We are the females. We're on the receiving end. As the female is the receiving end from her husband, identically, we're on the receiving end from, the, from God. He's the provider. That's the understanding. But nevertheless... As I mentioned, King Solomon tells us in Proverbs, Sony Matonisiche. The word person who despises gifts, he will live. Why is that? What is the source of all life? The source of all life is God. The more we emulate him, the more we connect to the source of life. Is God ever a taker or God's only a giver? God is always on the giving and never on the taking end. So King Solomon says, the one who despises gifts, you don't take gifts, but you're a giver, not a taker. You're reflecting God's characteristic. And therefore, the commonality to attach to him is greater. Therefore, you're more, you're more securely connected to the source of everything, of life. That's how it's explained. Now, it's true, we are the recipients. What is the natural choice of the human being? To do the will of God or not to do the will of God? What are we inclined to? We're inclined not to do his will. Because we're physical beings. All our inclinations are animalistic 
inclinations. Doing the will of God means we have to rein in on ourselves. So what is the concept reining in? We take what God gave us and don't do what put it in our pocket. Rather, we utilize it, something which is outside of ourselves. We do his will. We don't take it for ourselves. What's ourselves? Ourselves is the animal. What I'm inclined to, my choice is not me, it's him. So even though we're recipients, it's like the equivalent of female. But what does the mother do? She feeds her children. She clothes her children. She maintains the household that the husband wants. The values. Of course, there's a meeting of minds. But what's the primary char character of the home? What the father wants. And she's abiding by what they agreed upon is what the father wants. We may be the recipients of God's blessing. But what are we supposed to do with that blessing? We're supposed to use the blessing. It should be a blessing. A blessing is only God tells us how, how to be a, a beneficiary of that blessing. That's the understanding. 